Surely there's nothing that can go wrong by building up years of hype before finally releasing a long-anticipated sequel. I mean, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull lived up to everything Indiana Jones fans were hoping for. Independence Day Resurgence, Zoolander 2. The critics of all those movies agreed that the wait between movies was probably the best thing for the series, right? Clearly, I have nothing to worry about with this episode. Internet, welcome to Fee. Sorry, my cat sat on the I key. So in last week's part two of this epic Whovian adventure, we continued our quest to lay out point by point the reasons why Time Lords could technically walk among us. Wait, what? You're saying it wasn't last week? You're, you're telling me it was two years ago? No, no, that doesn't sound right. Are you sure you didn't fall into a TARDIS or something? Maybe you don't need proof that Time Lords exist because you are the Time Lord. No? Not buying it? Okay, well, here's the real story. For those of you who haven't been subscribed since literally the day this channel launched, we've done two Doctor Who theories in the past. The distant past. The very far distant past. The first two months of this channel past. <clears throat> and if you haven't seen them, you should probably go watch them now, I guess. I don't know, they were from the infancy of this channel. Who even knows what I was doing back in 2015? But this is a part three, so to not at least help you find parts one and two of the series, 78 videos later would be pretty mean of me. You can find both of those in the eye icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Which begs the question of why did it take me over two years to release the third theory? Maybe I needed to do some time travel research of my own. Maybe the feds were trying to silence me about Time Lords. Maybe I'm working on launching a new theory channel. Or maybe, just maybe, the script has been written the entire time, but I was never fully satisfied with the content contained in the episode. Not feeling substantial enough for a full-fledged theory that would be believable to you guys. Could be any one of those. Who knows? Maybe I just leave that one up to you guys to theorize about. But regardless, the time is here now because enough people at VidCon Australia pestered me about it, and I can finally, finally reveal to you all the truth. Time Lords are real. There's not just evidence for one or two of them. Oh no, sir. Crawling around the internet is actually evidence of a ton of these guys popping in and out of time and space. From simple entertainers like Nicolas Cage, who's made appearances as far back as the American Civil War. Oh, no, wait, earlier as a member of the famous Habsburg family. Or the man we currently know as Keanu Reeves popping in as early as the 8th century as Charlemagne. Yeah. Charlemagne himself. Whoa. Think it's just a Hollywood movie star conspiracy? Well, think again. Major political figurehead Vladimir Putin mysteriously doesn't seem to have aged in the over a hundred years he's been on the planet Earth. And Mark Zuckerberg is mysteriously also Prince Philip IV of Spain. But these could all be just doppelgangers, right? Mere lookalikes. Whoa, Peter Dinklage really does look like Diego Velasquez. Holy cow, should this episode just be about him? Wait, 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 don't lose focus, MatPat. All of these other schmoes are just fun lookalikes from the course of history. None of these times Time Lord candidates compared to the most well-documented contestant for Time Lord status, Comte de Saint-Germain. Never heard of him? Well, let me make some introductions since you'll be seeing him in your past, present, and future from now on. Comte de Saint-Germain, or just Count of Saint-Germain for those of you who failed French class, was your quintessential Renaissance man, born, in theory, in 1691. He was reportedly the son of Prince Francis II Rekocci. Rakotsky, 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 Prince Francis II of Transylvania, which, can we be honest, will always beat every other place for spookiest country contest. It turns out that Transylvania isn't just Dracula's favorite destination, it's also home to some pretty creepy time travelers as well. So while our buddy Komjaman lived there, he was a locally well-known philosopher, artist, scientist, and musician. That, in and of itself, isn't crazy, since we know other people in history, like Leonardo da Vinci have been renaissance men. But take a closer look at the Count's public-facing life and you start to see there's more to this man than meets the eye. A friend of his, Giacomo Casanova, wrote in his memoirs that the Count would regularly talk about knowing, quote, the secret of universal medicine, that he possessed a mastery over nature, that he could melt diamonds and have the ability to form out of 10 or 12 small diamonds one large one. And at dinner parties, the Count was known to talk about historical figures like Cleopatra and Henry VIII as if he knew them personally. When skeptical historians would try to trip the Count up by questioning him about 
tiny historical details, the Count would always reply with remarkable accuracy, leaving everyone dumbfounded by how much he seemed to know about people from completely different times and places. And remember, this was hundreds of years before modern communication, and only a couple hundred years after the printing press was invented. So everything the Count knew about music, philosophy, medicine, science, and history had to have been learned one page at a time over the course of a lifetime. Well, that or experienced one day at a time as you travel through an eternal lifespan. So okay, he knows more than he should about a few things and claims to know the secrets of science and medicine, but is that Time Lord worthy? It isn't on its own, but then consider this. The really funny thing about our buddy the Count is that no one really knew where he came from. In fact, while it was said that he was the son of Prince Francis II Rrrrrra of Transylvania, the only person who claimed this was the Count himself. And when he was pressed for an answer as to his origins, he told people he was 500 years old. I mean, really. Imagine that conversation. Uh, hello, where did you go to school? I'm 500 years old. I was born before universities were a thing. Oh my, I bet Greek life really blew chunks back then. In my day, Greek life was still being lived by the Greeks. 500 years old, you're really not getting this, are you? On top of that, he claimed to have been present at very specific historic events during his 500-year lifespan. He told people he had a room in the Tower of London in the 1300s. Then he claimed to have studied alchemy in France in the 1400s. And even if you don't go with drunk person at a party history, even the real, documented parts of his life seem to play into his claims. According to tangible historical records that do exist, he was actually born in 1691 and died in 1784 at the age of 90. Now, that's a pretty amazing lifespan for someone in the 17th century, but we're not just talking about one guy who lived a particularly long time in history. Instead, what we're looking at is a man who's capable of going wherever he wants or whenever he wants during that life, under tons of different aliases. He went by dozens of different names, the Marquis de Montferrat, Comte de Bellemar, Chev Chevalier, Schoening, Count Weldon, Count Solt Soltkoff, Graf Zargo- Jeez. Graf Sarogi and Prince R Prince Ragozki. <laughs> give up. I give up on that list. <laughs> Just to name a few, and the hardest few. He was apparently fluent in French and German, spoke some Polish, was learning English, but was most comfortable speaking Spanish or Portuguese. Besides being able to take on all kinds of different backgrounds and names, though, this guy also shows up all over the place. He was documented in London during the Jacobite Revolution, showed up in French court with Louis XV. He negotiated peace in Holland during the Seven Years' War. All this time, he was known as a wealthy aristocrat who had major art and book collections that he kept in his royal estates, but when he supposedly died, they found almost no possessions on him. He did all this traveling, participated in major historical events all across Europe, met some of the most famous people in the world, but didn't keep any sort of memorabilia, souvenirs, nothing? No artwork, no library of books, no castles, no snow globe? In fact, the town he died in had to auction off what little stuff he had six months after his funeral because no living relative came to claim any of it. None of it adds up to what most people would find believable from one guy's lifetime. And he's still not done, even after death. Over the years after his supposed death, he also just kept right on popping up at major historical events. In 1793, he supposedly appeared at the execution of Marie Antoinette, and in 1799, there was an account of him being present in the French courts during Napoleon's national coup. In 1820, on the night before Charles Ferdinand was murdered, the Countess de Adhemar reported visiting with him. In 1870, Napoleon III was apparently so interested in this quote-unquote undying count that he had a special commission put together to collect information on him. But all those records were mysteriously lost in a fire in 1871, only one year later. In 1914, two Bavarian soldiers claimed to have captured him during World War I, and on and on and on, with his latest appearance being as late as the 1960s at a political conference in Berlin. So Time Lords exist. They're on record. Call it case closed, everyone. We got him. 14th official doctor confirmed. Eh, but not so fast. Honestly, when I was scripting this episode many years ago, and now today, this is where I wanted to end it, with Time Lords existing and Doctor Who being totally plausible in real life. But while researching it, I'd be lying if I didn't say I came across some ideas that cast a bit of doubt onto this whole Time Lord conspiracy, and that the episode itself felt incomplete without discussing why this obviously probably isn't a real thing. What if I could not only tell you why we think Time Lords exist, but why we like to believe they exist in the first place? It turns out when we create conspiracies, 
fantasies like about Keanu Reeves having previous lives were actually engaging in a kind of intellectual gymnastics. Famous psychologist Kirby Farrell has written pretty extensively about conspiracies and how putting together the pieces of conspiracy puzzles give humans the same kind of satisfaction as putting together something like a complex jigsaw puzzle, or solving a difficult logic problem. It makes us smarter, it helps us to feel more empowered, and it actually makes us better equipped to solve problems in the real world, like programming computers, building car engines, and learning music. In the research Farrell has done, he's actually found that people who buy into conspiracy theories aren't the wide-eyed rubes you might think they are. In fact, it's the complete opposite. People who tend to love conspiracy theories, like... Uh, I don't know, people who watch online videos proving that their favorite characters from all sorts of media are secretly evil, they're not the gullible ones. They tend to be the skeptics of the world, whether they're cynical about something in life or just don't take what they're told at face value. Even in the face of social pressures, people who look for conspiracies tend to form their own opinions and buy into conspiracies on their own. Does that mean the conspiracies are right? <laughs> Most of the time, no. Conspiracy theories are just that. Is the Count of St. Germain a real Time Lord? Maybe! And then again, he was probably just a really good liar who read a lot of history books, sounded like he knew what he was talking about, and left a pretty hefty reputation behind him. If you stop and look at the facts, it was actually common for nobility to go by multiple names, so they could avoid talking to people that they didn't like. It was also common for them to travel around Europe and then inflate their stories about their own travels. Hashtag bragging rights. There was no fact checking at that time, so all he had to do to convince other people he was smart was just convincing whoever was in the room with him. And all those historical accounts of him appearing after he died, well, several of them were from an unhinged woman who fantasized about him after his death. The others were reporting from high-stress situations, like the battlefield in World War I and political negotiations during the Cold War. When you unpack a lot of conspiracies, you find that the majority of them are explained by simple, if kind of disappointing, logic. But at the end of the day, my point here is that that might not actually be what matters here. What matters is that you ask the question in the first place. That you saw evidence out there and you didn't take your own assumptions at face value. And for all you Whovians out there who've been waiting two years for this episode, well, one of the defining characteristics of that show is its constant ability to redefine your expectations, keep you curious, and keep you trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And a person who's skeptical of what they're told, looks for the facts themselves, and comes to their own opinions off of those facts? That's the type of person this world needs now more than ever. So maybe the two-year wait was worth it. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Hold up, you waited two years years for this episode, and now that you've watched it, you've got a whole nother month before the Doctor Who Christmas special. So what are you gonna do with your timey-wimey loving selves to fill the gap? How about watching another sci-fi series about people who travel through time to save the lives of others? Wow, that sounds a lot like Doctor Who, I hear you saying, and yes, yes it is. But it's even better because it's here on YouTube right now. All you need are two words, life Line. Well, it's two words, but they're fused together into one bigger word. A compound word, technically. Lifeline is all about a company that sends its agents 33 days into the future to save the lives of people that they know are gonna die. Kind of like mini Time Lords in training. One agent fails to save his wife's life, and suddenly it becomes a manhunt. Through time! And not only is it a cool concept that perfectly matches your interests in Doctor Who, but it's also a series done by my personal friends Sam and Nico from the channel Corridor Digital, who, if you're not familiar, have been pioneers of high-quality, effects-driven videos since the earliest days of YouTube. I love these guys, I love their work, and I think that you're gonna love them too. So check out their new series, Lifeline. The first episode is available right now, just wave your little sonic screwdriver over the link you see on screen, or click the link in the description, and then keep your eyes locked on the screen like it's an angel statue. And heck, if you like it, you've got yourself eight 30-minute episodes to fill your time. Enough to keep you busy until the premiere of the first ever female doctor in December. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to start working on another trilogy of episodes, the third part of which will come out years after it's relevant. See you then.